So I welcome all of you to the talk today by Vishnu Das. And introducing Vishnu, we have Tara Gandhi. Tara was guided by Dr. Salim Ali for her MSc degree in field on anthology. She has also edited an, an anthology of Salim Ali's writings titled A Bird's Eye View and a collection of Salim Ali's radio talks titled Words for Birds that's due to be published soon. Tara, over to you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Nikhil. It's such a delight for me to be here with uh, Delhi Birds. I admire you hugely for the enormous membership that you have and uh, for drawing in and inspiring people from so many walks of life in all ages to uh, enjoy birds and in fact the natural world. And what a pleasure to introduce uh, CK Vishnu Das. He is somebody I've known for a long time, many, many years. And I know how passionate he is about birds and about uh, conservation of avifauna. And this has been, it's wonderful for me to have, to have the opportunity to introduce him uh, to, uh, to, during his talk today. Uh, as a conservation biologist, he's had 20 years of experience, which to us has um, 20 years of experience on uh, ecological research with birds as his main subject in the Western Ghats and Eastern Ghats, Western Ghats, as well as in Central India. So his main interests have been ecology, evolution, and uh, biogeography and conservation with a special focus on endangered species and threatened ecosystems, such as the mountains. And he's been also involved very much in uh, conservation of vultures and helping with as part of the team that established vulture safe zones in India. He's published several research papers in national, international journals and co-authored two books on ornithology uh, uh, and natural history of Kerala. Importantly, he's also published uh, two genera of birds and the new species uh, endemic to mountains of Western Ghats, which is quite an achievement. And currently he's working on uh, bird biogeography uh, of the Indian subcontinent, the whole Indian subcontinent, and on disease ecology in mountain ecosystems. Very unusual subject, definitely, with emphasis on avian malaria. And in addition to this, he also heads the Hume Center for Ecology and Wildlife Biology, of which he's the founder. And this institution focuses on scientific research on climate change, impacts and conservation, as well as science education. A very impressive list indeed, uh, Vishnu. Um, and uh, I compliment you on all that you've achieved so far. Now, I would say it's not surprising that uh, Vishnu's entire career has been with birds and mountain ecology, having been born in Wainat, which is the picturesque hill area of uh, Kerala that is so well known for it is spectacular uh, diversity of birds. And he says he was deeply in, uh, inspired by his bird loving members of his family. And as well as by Salim Ali, even though he was, even as a young boy, even as a young boy, he was uh, very inspired by Salim Ali. And his talk today is about the remarkable survey that he along with his team had re-traced Dr. Salim Ali's uh, Travanko Cochin Ontological Survey in the 1930s after a period of 75 years. It's uh, quite an extraordinary uh, achievement, I would say. So now we know that Salim Ali uh, carried out many surveys all over the country throughout his life. But his Travanko Cochin Survey was something special that he writes about in his autobiography. We'll come to that a little later. See, I was a student and uh, I had the huge privilege of knowing him during the last years of his life, you know, Salim Ali. You, know, you can put my first slide, Nikhil, if you like. And so, and, and that's a long time ago, as you can see. And I realized that though he was India's greatest ornithologist and conservationist, his, at his, in his heart, he was an explorer and a field person. And you can see he's about nearly 90 years old 
uh, at this time that the picture was taken. But his energy was incredible and as was his uh, great intellect. And you can take off the slide now, thank you. And why- You want to go to the next slide? Uh, not yet, just a second. Yes, you can, you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, you know, he, in, in the, at that time, you could see that even though he was 90 years old, he was real restless to get into the field. He was a field person. And once he was in, his, in, his, in the field sites of my study areas, he was completely in his element. And through his, his surveys and studies carried him to the length and breadth of India. And here, this, this, these pictures would just show you the kind of uh, landscapes that he crossed. You know, the desert in Kutch on Camelback, uh, on Yakback in Sikkim, the bullock cart in, uh, in forests of the south, and elephant back maybe in Corbett, I don't know where, but definitely uh, he went on elephant back crossing rivers. He was adventurous. He was an outdoors person. Yeah, the next one also, please. So he also had mishaps and uh, adventures where, you know, old fashioned vehicles that wouldn't cross, uh, that would uh, need to be sometimes pulled out by a bullock cart. And he went by boat for island bird surveys. So this is a kind of, uh, you know, covered the length and breadth of the country. In fact, they say that no inch of our country has been left untouched by, by his uh, feet. So, uh, of course, in those days, in those days, uh, ornithological surveys also meant collection of specimens. And the skins of these birds that, he, that they collected during the 1930s and 40s uh, make up the museum collection of BNHS and other institutes, which are used for taxonomical studies and uh, for identification interests. But even those days, even those days, if you read his autobiography, can see that Salim Ali was not really interested in, in, in specimens. He really wanted to study the live bird in his own uh, natural environment. Yeah, thank you. Now, the next slide, please. Yes, uh, but the, of all the surveys, he really found the Travanko Cochin survey very interesting and exciting. And he was lucky to have his wife, uh, Temina, uh, with him during that survey. And they traveled part of the journey in this interesting little coach on the forest tramway, the Cochin forest tramway. And uh, I think that all this added to his excitement. And you can see from, his, uh, from I'm going to quote, the next slide is a quote of his. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you. So he says so clearly over here, if you read it, that of all the regional surveys, this, this gave him the greatest satisfaction and it provided the basis for a book. And he found the beauty of the place uh, matchless and the lushness and grandeur of the primeval forest. And finally, he said, for the diversity of bird life in Kerala, this is yeah, number one. And I thought that was very uh, touching uh, tribute to the forests and birds of, uh, of Kerala. And so, but I have to say that after he, he had done his survey, he revisited Tattikad and other places. He talks about Tattikad as the richest bird habitat in peninsula India at that time. But he revisited the place after independence and he said he was more and more depressed and scandalized each time, seeing the irreparable damage on account of logging and clearing evergreen forests, monocultures, industries, and the drowning of huge areas under the water spread of dams. So, yes, thank you, uh, Nikhil. You can take the slide off now. So, uh, Vishnu, I, I want to say how important this resurvey of yours is now after so many years, after so many decades, which even Salim Ali, even after a few years found huge changes. We are um, very eager to, uh, to hear what, you talk, what you're going to say. Tell us about uh, the, the places that you visited with he, where he had trod himself. It must have been a very emotional and ex exciting experience for you. 
that looking forward to hearing about this unique experience of yours. So over to you, Vishnu. Thank you, Tara. Thank you very much. I am much delighted to have Tara Gandhi here. Like uh, that's also uh, uh, much more enjoyable and also uh, and thank you so much, Tara, for introducing me. And we know each other for many, many years. And quite often, I, uh, uh, I think, uh, communicated many times regarding my career also. And I found one of the best book uh, I ever written about Salim Ali is about the two volumes that you brought out, like the unknown, uh, you know, uh, communications and letters and things like that, that actually helped uh, people like me to go deeper into that. And there are many parts uh, when we look at that book actually uh, shows about flower birds and bird flowers, something like uh, we are just taking up nowadays, you know, how climate change is affecting the phenological part, mm -hmm. how, how seasons are being affected. So these things are not in much, much more de detail in Salim Ali's general books, but covered in the two volumes that you brought out. And thank you so much for this introduction. And I'm happy that the Delhi board is uh, organizing this opportunity. Uh, to talk about uh, Salim Ali's trail that we did almost 10 years <laughs> before. And uh, I think the, 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 the lockdown actually helped a lot us to connect from remote places. And uh, that is one way actually, uh, uh, you know, helping us to reach out to more people and talk about uh, those kind of works which are done, even though it is a little bit earlier. So I'll, uh, uh, within this uh, uh, one hour time, I would like to go through the uh, the the major aspects of uh, uh, the the findings or, or the learnings or what we learn from the revisiting process uh, uh, through uh, and uh, uh, and the major findings or whatever things like that I would like to share. But uh, uh, there are uh, there is uh, the the whole uh, uh, study was actually documented in a book form. Uh, that is published by State Forest Department as uh, along the trail of Salim Ali, and which illustrate uh, detailed, uh, you know, analysis and the findings. Uh, and those who wanted to look much more details, uh, you can go to the uh, refer to the that uh, book that is published by the Forest Department. So I'll now just go for uh, my presentation. So. Can you see the slides now? Yes, clear. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I think I don't need to introduce Salim Ali, but uh, from Salim Ali, what I, I learned from his, uh, you know, uh, the book uh, on his autobiography is that, uh, uh, you know, he started keeping notes on birds from at the age of nine. And that is very, very important. Like, you know, even now we do a lot of birding. Uh, uh, what about Salim Ali? A very peculiarity as a scientist is that he was uh, very, very systematic. I think a tradition that has been carried out from uh, British ornithologist uh, mostly. And Salim Ali may be perhaps the, uh, uh, one of the best example uh, uh, once we, you, you will feel it when you go through his, uh, you know, personal notes and uh, other writings and how meticulously he kept uh, notes. Even when we were trying to do the, uh, the uh, Salim Ali's trail after uh, 75 years. So what actually helped uh, uh, us to identify the places where he has gone is mostly from his personal note as well as the publications. Uh, by along with Hugh Whistler. Uh, and he, he has actually mentioned about the city of the particular location. So that helped us to compile the information over a period of time, what has been changed over a period of time in that particular location. So, and, and he was very much uh, dreamt about birds and very, very, very much, much, uh, you know, in a way he was very much hardworking. And the schedule we can imagine like uh, it starts from almost six o'clock in the evening until midnight. Uh, they used to spend in the time like uh, morning hours full of collection by around 11 they will start skinning so then taking notes of each and every aspect of the uh, specimen that they collected so he was very meticulous to uh, you know uh, 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 write down the uh, the each and every aspect of a specimen that they got and that is what makes Salim Ali a great scientist of uh, our time 
So the Travancore Cochin Ornithological Survey uh, started uh, in 1933 uh, on the request uh, by Salim Ali itself. So Salim Ali uh, started just before that he has actually done the, the Hyderabad Ornithological Survey. And on the understanding that there was not much uh, uh, you know, field studies in India and there are many, many more areas to be covered and, uh, throughout the India. So the first survey was the Hyderabad Ornithological Survey. Then followed by he wrote to the Travancore uh, 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 King, and uh, for with an appeal to conduct the surveys in the uh, uh, Travancore uh, uh, region. So based on that, the uh, the uh, based on that uh, letter, uh, the the Travancore Raja they allowed uh, uh, permission to Salim Ali, and Salim Ali has requested. Uh, uh, rupees 2000 for his uh, entire survey and that is one thing we have to make and towards the end uh, Salim Ali actually it is mentioned in his uh, uh, autobiography about how much he spent for this entire exercise and uh, Salim Ali was actually uh, supported by NG Pillai uh, a curator from uh, Trivandrum Museum um, for his surveys so Salim Ali came with his uh, wife and an assistant uh, and he also used the service of local uh, uh, people for collecting uh, bird specimens. And by the time the Travancore uh, Raja, uh, the Travancore Raja and their administrators also uh, extended their support by providing the service of NG Pillai also with the Salim Ali team. And the Pillai later actually gained a lot of experience working with Salim Ali, and he's one of the uh, uh, very much skilled, uh, you know, uh, bird skinner and taxidermist at that time. So basically, Salim Ali's survey, uh, actually, uh, when we look at the um, uh, uh, significance of his contribution, so this actually, this 1933 survey was the basis of uh, uh, ornithology in Kerala. And, and before that, there was uh, uh, a smaller works in certain regions, like uh, in Trondam side and, and the uh, Padagiri side, like in the Liyabadi Hills and all that, some British uh, naturalist. And they collected uh, bird specimens from there and, and uh, sent to uh, Hume, who was running the stray for this journal at that time. And many of those, uh, uh, you know, um, details about uh, or the list and findings about uh, birds from these regions mainly uh, came from those uh, British naturalists who was actually serving in many parts of the southern India. So after the, uh, so with this uh, in mind, Salim Ali wrote to the Travancore uh, uh, Raja and they got the permission. And they started their work in 1933, uh, starting from January. And uh, in South uh, at Ravangur, uh, so they he started about uh, he conducted his survey about in 14 places, and and started from Marayur, and ended up in the Cape Comorin in Kanyagumari. So uh, within this uh, uh, long area, uh, he has actually uh, camped in 14 places. And after that, he went to uh, Cochin. Cochin was under this different ruler at that time. And, late, uh, and there he conducted about uh, surveys in the five locations. So initially, uh, uh, Salim Ali himself has prepared uh, uh, a detail by studying the map of the location. He suggested certain places. But in, under consultation from the state uh, forest department and authorities, he modified the locations and then came with the 14 locations for Travancore area and another five locations for Cochin states. So the survey started in 3rd January and ended on December 1933. So this was the, the upper side shows the, the then uh, Cochin uh, territory. So I'll just share the, the, the itinerary of the survey. From Manayur, he started on 3rd uh, uh, January and continued till 15th January. And uh, next day, he started at uh, Munar. So right now, I think this was one of the uh, fascinating things. Also. For example, like today, we have a lot of facilities to travel from Mariu to Munar. And, and we were just thinking like how he been traveling from Mariu to Munar and those times through the guard road. Uh, you know, after finishing his survey on 15th Mariu and next day morning, he started his work in the Munar. So that is what is uh, Salim Ali is meant for, like very systematic planning and executing his plans in a very systematic way. And that is one of the reasons that we are, we got such a wonderful information that is compiled in the handbook of the birds of India and Pakistan in 12 volume. So in today's time, uh, I, I don't think any, any scientist can do and that scale of a work in one 
one person's lifetime. So this whole itinerary shows like a very systematic. That is what I wanted to show, talk about the the, the planning of this uh, uh, survey by Salim Ali. And by end of uh, March, he was in uh, Trivandrum. And uh, from 16th July, uh, 16th July in uh, April, uh, uh, end of March, he reached Trivandrum. And from again in April and July, and July to August, he came back to Trivandrum again for uh, some more time. And from April to, uh, uh, from the in the month of April 1933, he again uh, went back to uh, the, the Cape Comorian, Aramboli, and then into Cochin states. So that is the general thing. Then you go to uh, career Kuriyar Kuti, that is in the Cochin state. And he did his survey from November uh, 12th till December 1933. So methodology in 1933 was just like uh, as Tara Gandhi mentioned, it was about uh, collecting specimens. So um, those days there was not much specimens available on Indian birds. So the primary objective of the study was to collect so Hugh Whistler actually communicated with Salim Ali. There are a lot of letters available between Salim Ali and Whistler and suggesting that at least uh, three specimens of each species should be collected. And in case any specificity, and you wanted to, if you wanted to look at any specific uh, aspect of a particular race or a particular species, you can have a, a, a slightly two or three more uh, individuals of the same species. So that is, what, that is how they were planned to collect the specimens. And apart from that, the, actually in, in Salim Ali's and Whistler's discussion, they were clearly mentioning about the importance of taking notes on the habitat. So I was wondering like even just uh, before this talk, I was just going through the literature again and again. I was wondering like uh, in the conclusion, Salim Ali was talking about the, 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 the Satpura hypothesis, you know, uh, how birds of the Southern India has actually uh, originated. What was the, the 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 passage of dispersal? Whether it was from Himalayas or whether it is often uh, you know confined to the uh, the northeast. So he was actually concluding in later period of his time. He was concluding about the possible uh, origin of the birds of the southern India and how certain birds are uh, you know affiliated to the uh, the Himalayan side and to the other side and how birds of even Sri Lanka has been originated. So how, what is the dispersal route? So I think if you look at old literature uh, uh, of birds or, or if you're looking into the, uh, uh, the specimens that they collected at that time, and, and you could see the even the minute differences were noted. So in later period of time, there was a lot of uh, lumping of species like, okay, uh, the, the, the small scale features are not that much important and they lump, lump together and uh, and we have come out with uh, very, uh, about 1000 to 100, 200 species for India. But uh, later period of time, we also uh, uh, worked on the biogeography of uh, the birds in Western Ghats. And we found that many uh, lineages entirely uh, uh, different uh, than what we thought originally. So this uh, this details, this fine scale details of uh, taxa is very, very important. I think Salim Ali has done a great job. And where, whenever we have uh, any doubt, we can go back to the handbook of the birds of the world and find out, okay, what Salim, has, Salim Ali has talked about this. So apart from that, uh, Salim Ali has actually taken a detailed note of the location habitat and, and that actually uh, helped us to compile the, the natural history uh, at that time in that particular location. So in 19, 2009, when we did the survey, uh, uh, we actually uh, used this as an opportunity to visit the place and uh, find out what birds are there. And we use a different kind of methodology because there's no need to follow an uh, old kind of uh, methodology. And that was not the purpose at all. And we used a variable with the distance transect uh, method for identifying birds so that we can repeat the survey in future uh, in, in a similar fashion so that we can uh, find out the abundance, diversity and density of the birds uh, using encounter transect method and with the distance bands. And we have also done vegetation sampling to look at what has changed to some extent at that time. And for future, we can actually compare uh, from 2009, now almost 10 years passed uh, uh, since the, our survey has done in 2009. Now, maybe in 15 years time or 20 years time, we can, whether we can do it on the social same places again and look at what what, what is uh, there and what has been changed over a period of time. So that we followed a very standard uh, methodology, which is aligned with the modern science uh, methods. So this was uh, just a tag uh, uh, how the specimen was uh, kept 
uh, after uh, you know uh, collecting the specimen and if we look at uh, uh, we spend uh, during the work we also spend some time in Rwanda Natural History Museum and then we worked almost three months looking at old specimens uh, collected by British naturalists and those specimens were actually kept in an old room which was not uh, looked for many many years and what actually motivated us that uh, in the Salimali's note uh, there was a mention and that the collected samples once it was given to the Travancore uh, uh, Natural History Museum and we, when we visited the museum we could not find uh, any 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 specimens that is um, collected by Salim Ali and we had a long discussion with the uh, the the, uh, the museum authorities and they said that we don't find anything here and uh, they, and one of the superintendent they suggested that there was an old room locked in that uh, building and let us uh, look at that so then we went to that room and it was locked for many many uh, some years and not used uh, for uh, any other purposes and we opened the door and found out that in that uh, actually it was a junk and within that big room, uh, there was a lot of, uh, uh, a few uh, big, uh, you know, shelves are there and none of them we were able to open. Then we had to take a help of a carpenter to open it up and we found that there was a lot of specimens in that. So we found, and interestingly, there was about uh, hundreds of specimens and many specimens were very finely preserved. And uh, when we checked, uh, then that was actually when we informed this into the uh, state forest department and they said that let us uh, do some examination on that and make a catalog. And that. Then in the break time during the survey, we spent almost two months uh, uh, in the museum and uh, cataloged uh, almost all the specimen that is available there. And we found around 2,400 specimens of that. And within that, uh, there were specimens which are 150 years old. And uh, and but but we could not find uh, Salimali's none of the Salimali specimens. Uh, later, after completing this work, almost a year back, I got a we got a call from the, the superintendent again, and superintendent called me called us that uh, uh, you have to come back again. Then we said why we have to come. Then there is another set of specimens. Then this time uh, we were really wondering like where this has been kept. Even the uh, superintendent was not knowing about this collection. So they said that there was another room which was locked. And uh, one, uh, you know, wooden shelf in front of uh, uh, that broken down and behind that another shelf. So they open it and they're lying the specimens of the Salimali. So I was, we were just wondering like how these specimens were kept in those times, maybe in the post-independence period, even in the Natural History Museum. And we, again, uh, we were moved to many other places. Most of our team members were uh, separated and worked for independently in different places, but we came together and we moved to Trivandrum almost in a, uh, one month and we cataloged all the Salimali specimens also. And we found one of the most interesting specimen of uh, Leggy's uh, hockey girl. That was the single specimen available from the, of the species in India. So that was still there in Salimali's uh, collection. So I just wanted to share some of these findings during the survey. So uh, this findings of the uh, uh, Salimali uh, survey was published in, in 1933, 34, 35 period, jointly authored by Hugh Whistler and Salimali, the ornithology of Travancore and Cochin. And this actually, I, I think about 245 pages are there. It's one of the most uh, illustrated, uh, detailed uh, work of this particular survey. So, and from there, uh, the first book uh, in 1953, The Birds of Travancore and Cochin was published by Salim Mali. And this book was actually revised again in 1984, uh, 1969 as The Birds of Kerala. So, Birds of Kerala is the first publication about the uh, birds, uh, bird diversity of Kerala. And uh, that gives a, a very good foundation. And later on, uh, you know, that uh, uh, Professor Nilakandan has done a, a wonderful work on ornithology of Kerala and came out with the well illustrated, nicely readable uh, Malayalam book, Kerala Telepachiga. So, and after that, uh, these two books actually influence a lot of borders in Kerala. And now we have a very good group of borders in the entire uh, state of Kerala. And the Kerala state has actually uh, finished the first bird atlas of the country. So I, I would just go back to the uh, uh, the the old uh, you know the contribution of Salim Ali and followed by Dr. Nilagandan and many others in establishing and moving taking forward the ornithology of Kerala into a greater level. So this is the uh, the first uh, version, uh, first uh, edition of the Birds of Kerala uh, book by Salim Ali. And the right, right side is the, the, the note, the, the series of uh, articles published by Salim Ali and Whistler in the Ornithology of Travancore Cochin in the Journal of Buenachos. 
So as Tara Gandhi mentioned, and uh, Salim Ali uh, wrote in his um, uh, Fall of His Sparrow, uh, of all my regional surveys, perhaps the one that gave me the greatest satisfaction, both as to the fieldwork and writing up his result was the Ornithological Survey of Travancore Cochin. And you can imagine that the a kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, pressure on us to, uh, while retracing uh, such a brilliant work by Salim Ali. So uh, in, uh, in 2009, uh, 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 it was a, uh, there was one letter from BNHS to the uh, State Forest Department that uh, Salim Ali's Ravangur Cochin survey has been conducted almost 75 years now. And if it would be good to look at uh, retrace the trail by some group or something like that. And Forest Department immediately called for the uh, meeting at state level and invited Shashi Kumar and uh, C. Shashi Kumar. He was actually supposed to give the presentation and interested me to do this and to lead the team. And we four or five of them uh, 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 came together and uh, uh, become part of this uh, uh, work. So, and we are also supported by a good team of Forest uh, Department officials from the top. And I should also uh, mentioned the name of say, Mr. Uh, then uh, uh, forest conservator, chief forest conservator, Mr. T. M. Manoharan, uh, actually who was actually uh, the brain behind uh, taking up this work. Otherwise, this would not have been possible. By uh, and the entire team of forest department of the uh, uh, South Kerala, and they have helped a lot in the logistical arrangement and everything. And we didn't face much problem faced by uh, Salim Ali in those time. But even though it was very tough to conduct the survey on time. And uh, and I'll introduce my team. The the this is uh, from right to left. This is Raju S. Raju is currently into Andram, uh, heading an NGO. And this is Mr. Shashi Kumar. He's an ornithologist and author of the Birds of Kerala Starts of Distribution book. And this is Vinayan. And this is me. And this is uh, uh, <coughs> sorry, Kanan. So Kanan is now a range officer in in forest department. So we, uh, uh, the methodology that we used uh, was, uh, we surveyed all the 19 locations and we looked at the abundance, diversity and density of birds using encounter transit method. And uh, yeah, and we used uh, the, we also surveyed the vegetation uh, using standard methods. And primary source of this transit was the places mentioned in the scientific paper, the Ornithology of Tanakur and Cochin, eight parts. And uh, we took indications from species accounts in the paper from altitude and description of the habitat from which the species was collected or seen. So Salimali has very clearly mentioned, and you'll find out in subsequent uh, slides and how meticulous he was uh, describing the locations and all that. So representative habitats of each area in consultation with, and we also consulted lo local ornithologists and forest department officials to while uh, retracing the places. So the expected outcome was information on the changes in the avifauna of the region of the last 75 years and the habitat quality of the region, information on the anthropogenic factors affecting the quality of bird habitats and uh, a publication of the book and uh, scientific articles. And this was uh, the meeting of the uh, happened on 2009 in Monar under the chairmanship of the then PCC of Mr. T. M. Anoharan, Dr. V. S. Vijayan, Dr. Lalita Vijayan, and Dr. Greb was also present along with uh, other officials and all. And this is uh, happened on 2nd January. That was the day we started our work. Salimali started on 3rd uh, uh, from uh, Mario. So after that meeting, we, our team immediately went to the Mario. So I'll go uh, location wise. So just wanted to see a perspective. Uh, Mario, uh, uh, so, so this, is, this was the first place that we surveyed. In Salimali's uh, time, 1933, Salimali described this place, not much people, uh, you know, very, uh, and, and, and there was a lot of change happened in this uh, small uh, hill village. It was a village at that time. Now there is a lot of changes happen, especially on the habitat uh, uh, of the Mariu. So we actually, uh, we, were, we, we talked to the, the Mudwan community at that, uh, on the mountain slopes. And we visited uh, uh, most of the places that Salimali mentioned. Uh, Salimali actually mentioned certain routes, like I, I travel from uh, this place into the Kumarikal. So Mariu to Kumarikal was a very steep trekking onto the, uh, from 1,000 uh, meters into 2,100 meters along the ridge of the Ervigula National Park. So, so even he mentioned the exact road where he have, uh, you know, exact track he has gone. And we could also follow at certain point of time, we could not even uh, walk along the ridge. It was so steep. So you can imagine like uh, what kind of uh, 
uh, effort he has taken at that time to capture birds and and Mariur is actually a, 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 a settlement area where you have a lot of indigenous communities and they live on the mountain slopes. And we, we have taken around uh, from 3 to 12th, we have taken uh, almost uh, about 10 transects in that area, covering most of the places. And interestingly, uh, you know that um, with our modern systems and um, techniques and, and not, we were not going for a collection of species, but uh, we were observing birds in the wild. So uh, even Salimali at that time, Salimali has recorded about 101 species from uh, uh, Marayu. And we actually found around 165 species. So we cannot compare species as such. Okay, what is that? But uh, what we looked at was what are the important uh, uh, sightings from this survey and what is missing from old survey. That will be interesting. So important sightings for us was the Amur Falcon, Eurasian Crack Martin, Brown Headed Barbet, and Blue Beard Beetle. So they, and we also found a Blue Beard Beetle breeding in, in Mario at that time. And significant absence was the vultures. So Wasalimali has actually described a lot of vultures from Mariyut landscape. So uh, I am giving a separate slide on vultures, what has happened to vultures in the entire, and, and also about water birds. So what we found was, uh, uh, the Mariyut actually has, uh, you know, it is very, very famous for sandalwood trees. And the sandalwood trees, there was a lot of sandalwood smuggling in, 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 in the mid 80s and 70s and 80s and up to 90s. And the forest department has started, started putting fence across this area. And now the habitat is actually fenced by this kind of uh, meshes and all that. So certain birds cannot fly and go through this kind of uh, system. So you are always blocked by your flight or you, so if somebody, some falcon is, uh, uh, you know, chasing a parakeet. So sometimes you, you, you cannot, uh, you know, the falcon cannot enter through that and parakeet can pass through sometimes. Smaller birds can go, larger birds cannot. So it can also affect the, the flight pattern and all that. But these are the things that we found something interesting in this landscape, apart from uh, the general changes. Looking at general habitat change, so there is tremendous change in the population. So human population has increased a lot. Paddy fields all converted to sugarcane cultivation and housing, and extensive cultivation of lemongrass and black wattle in the grasslands. So grasslands of all the Mariyur slopes have gone, and uh, in many places you can extensive plantation of eucalyptus along with the steep along along the steep slopes of the mountain. So people are also complaining in certain areas about the shortage of drinking water because earlier the whole Mariyur Valley was much full of uh, uh, you know uh, rice fields and rice cultivation. Now it moved into a sugar cane and scarcity of water was actually reported by the local people. So then from there we moved to Munar. Munar is you know that one of the uh, high altitude uh, area in, in Western Ghats. And, uh, and we covered uh, many places in Munar. We traveled to the Arvigulam, the fringes of Arvigulam National Park and other places mentioned by the Salim Ali in that time. And this is uh, about 2,100 meter, 2,200 meter elevation near the Anamudi Shola National Park called Mettab. And we have been actually accompanied by many, uh, many uh, birders from Kerala also uh, for a shorter period of time, three days, four days. And uh, they also got an exposure to join the survey team and. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, 16 to 21, we spent Namakar, Shola, Metta, uh, Kannimala, Podamed, Kadalar, Top Station. Kadalar and all that, Salimalia clearly mentioned about the Kadamam Hill Reserve. So, there he collected a lot of birds. And Top Station in Bambadambala and uh, Podamed, these are the main locations. So, Munar actually looking at the, you know, the, this is the Anamudi site. And, uh, um, you know, it's a Shola grassland complex, but the rest of the uh, mountain was uh, completely gone into tea garden. So owned by the Kanandevan tea plantation. So we can see that very few of the original landscape left now for the species to survive. For example, these are the primary habitats of the mountain babblers like the Laughing Thrushes or the Chilapens and Sholikola or the Short Wings and many other black and orange flycatchers and all that. So, but uh, a major portion of the habitat actually moved into or plantations and all that. So there is not much uh, primary habitats left now. Uh, in that. So I'm using only the photographs that we have taken during the survey. So these are all captured at different locations uh, uh, at different places. So the, the photographs that I'm showing from uh, at Munar is actually captured from Munar itself. So, <clears throat> and and you can see this is Robus elliptica one, one uh, you know, uh, Salimali actually uh, highlighted 
its association with the our uh, garulac species of uh, uh, you know chilapins so in western ghats so wherever he actually say that wherever you when you trek from the low valley into a mountain so wherever you meet this uh, you know rubus elliptica you can see the lofty thrush so that's what uh, salim ali mentioned so he clearly talk about uh, this kind of uh, small small things which are very very important when you identify a species in a habitat so I, uh, we were wondering like in munar salimilia has not uh, recorded much species and he uh, we still wonder what, what he was doing there maybe um, and he recorded 30 species and uh, our interesting species were uh, black and orange thin gray fly catcher white belly short wing wood pigeon pipit spot bill duck scaly thrush and tick tightless leaf warbler and things like that and we came across about 107 species and uh, a very interesting thing about munar is that uh, a jungle crow widespread among hills up to anamudi so uh, salim ali actually mentioned it absent in munar so this is a very important information from this survey like salim ali has, so he salim ali actually spent a lot of days in munar but he he clearly mentioned like crows are absent in jungle crows absent in munar and we could see jungle crow up to the mountains like everywhere wherever you go in the munar township crows are one of the commonest species and another important thing was the common buzzard emigrated raptor uh, not seen by salim ali salim ali if salim ali has seen it he would have mentioned it but uh, but nowadays common buzzard is very common i think uh, this particular buzzard actually started uh, moving into the south as a winter visitor or something like that we do not know because we don't have previous information but this is one of the most common raptor on the mountain grasslands and where normally we see the black winged kite as the one of the Uh, common species of such kind of a grassland but we could not see much black winged kite but we saw uh, mostly common buzzard of this and tickers warbler was actually uh, widespread and not recorded by salim ali during the survey so even though salim ali has visited on this um, slopes of the elvikulam national park and many places yeah. so this is common buzzard and this is the jungle crow and booted uh, eagle and this is generally the habitat of munar you know that the uh, uh, maybe before uh, the tea gardens these were all very good sholas and grasslands so now this area has been converted into plantation and uh, kanandevan company actually keep a, a little bit of shola uh, within their plantation so that actually serve as a small habitat uh, a really patches of shola support the organisms to survive in any in many places but not much the entire habitat has gone into uh, and there is a lot of uh, uh, high uh, you know intensive pesticide application that we could see wherever we have been uh, traveling and another impact is uh, the the uh, you know plantation of eucalyptus on the mountain slopes so government is now planning for restoration and all that but our own later studies shows that the, uh, the this planted uh, you know the eucalyptus actually planted to support the firewood for the tea, tea industry apart from that uh, uh, there was forest department they themselves started some plantations in 80s and all that and, uh, and and from there this species actually naturally inverted into the pristine habitat so that actually replaced many of the endemic grasslands areas uh, uh, areas of the mountains so like many places these uh, exotic species have inverted so changes in habitat in munar if you look at extensive plantation of tea eucalyptus and natural vegetation is seen only in some shola patches and pesticides are used in many 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 places and uh, uh, in general bird life is very poor in plantation and that is quite natural and compared to sholas but some shola patches are maintained by in recent times by the kanandevan and uh, there you can see some of these endemic birds are surviving from there we went to shantambara there is another side of the munar idiki district and uh, shantambara when actually welcomed us by this uh, habitat because this has smaller uh, hills and frequently burned and we could not see like uh, we could see that the the because of the regular fire the the uh, you know even the forest the 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 evergreen forest are being replaced by some kind of a semi evergreen and very uh, secondary kind of a forest and not much bird population in those areas so this particular place nulangulam is specially mentioned by salim ali in his uh, 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 his um, uh, that journal article and we we actually went to that particular place and it is named as nulangulam and uh, we found some certain uh, endemic birds around that area and not much change uh, happened in this particular place so when we look at shadambara salim ali recorded 90 species and we recorded 105 species nilgiri pipit grey breasted laughing thrush bonelli eagle booted eagle short-toed snake eagle what has changed in avifauna 
the insectivorous birds of the middle and understory was totally absent, probably due to the use of pesticides in Kadama. Because, okay, you know that Kadama Foundation used a lot of pesticides, about 30 to 50 different category of pesticide has been identified by one of the scientists who works in Kadama Research Station earlier. And now we could see the entire uh, uh, that middle structure, understory uh, uh, birds are really absent from that. And we could not see any great white hornbill because the major trees are all uh, maybe cut down in, in later period of time during the seven and a half years of uh, 75 years of time. Uh, a lot of activities have happened in the Kadama Hill Reserve. I think we could not find much more bigger trees except in one or two estates, which are maintained by certain people who are a little more conservation oriented. But other than that, we could not see the, the, the insectivorous birds. And grass, grassland birds are also very scarce, probably due to the repeated burning of uh, grassland. So we found burning is happening. Uh, it's not a, a wildfire, but it's actually a fire caused by people. So these are some of the birds they had a fly catcher. And from there, we went to Tatekat. Tatekat, when Salimali was visiting, it was a very nice forest area. And when we were visiting, it was there was, uh, you know, the entire uh, Travancore Cochin, about nine reservoirs have come after 1933. And Satekad was actually a uh, major portion of the Satekad forest was actually gone under the uh, water. And whatever remaining, even though Satekad provides a lot of uh, bird diversity now, and that is a mix of uh, wetland birds plus the forest birds, but the real the forest habitat have actually shrunk over a period of time. And Satekad offers you very nice, uh, uh, you know, images in the evening. You can see sunset, sun, sunset in a very uh, brilliant way. And uh, we identified 126 and uh, uh, we ended up identifying 168 species, uh, Salimali by 126. And our important species here are night jar, great night, great year night jar, state elect crake, black bassa, great black woodpecker, tree pie, gray headed bulbul, silot frogmouth, and lesser fish eagle. So I just tell you about this uh, uh, story of lesser fish eagle. Uh, and the major changes are most of the habitats are by SA submerged under the reservoir or has been changed into plantations. This is a major change that we observe. And quality of grassland is extremely poor due to repeated burning and grasslands birds were absent. So we were expecting like a broad grass wobbler and those kind of birds or paddy field pipit in the smaller grass patches, but we could not see any of those kind of, uh, and, and it, all these areas are subject to at least uh, every three year or two year fire comes in and destroy the uh, tall grasses and it has to come back. Maybe that is the time all these grassland birds are breeding like April, May, summer months, mostly the our uh, tropical birds are mostly breeding during the summer months. So if the, if the fire comes in that particular time, it will definitely affect the, uh, in the breeding uh, success of these kind of species. So several, in addition, several wetland birds have colonized in the reservoir and this environment. So that is an advantage. You can see all the grades and uh, herons and all the cormorants in good numbers in the habitat. So certain species is lost and certain other species have come. But those who came uh, after the reservoir was mostly the generalist and those who lost the habitat are mostly the specific, uh, you know, specialists who have who have to confine to certain areas of uh, forest for, uh, you know, their survival. So, and frogmouth is very, uh, very interesting species from Tartekad. We also saw a uh, uh, few frogmouths from that area. And lesser fish eagle. So one day we were about to travel, uh, start our uh, morning uh, uh, trekking uh, into forest area. Then suddenly one of the forest uh, staff came and informed that there was a one bird they got in a, uh, in a captured, in some injured bird. Then we rushed to the place and we could see that it is nothing other than lesser fish eagle. You know that lesser fish eagle was uh, not much recorded in Kerala at that time. And uh, there was the old records were mostly referring to the uh, greater, greater fish eagle. And by the time we suddenly saw this lesser fish eagle and we could not wait uh, too much uh, at that uh, place and we just took some pictures and uh, and we are on the way uh, when we were traveling on the boat we also saw one more uh, lesser fish eagle on the uh, that reservoir. So this was the first time we got a, a photograph of this uh, fish eagle, uh, one of the first, first photos of the lesser fish eagle in Kerala. <clears throat> so it was caged. And Dr. Sugudan was looking at uh, taking care of that birds at that time. So Salimali has specifically mentioned, uh, very interesting to see, the country hereabouts is stiff with the wild elephants and bird collecting often provided unexpected thrills. So, so we experienced the same thing like uh, when we were uh, trekking through, uh, uh, you know, the Tatekad forest. 
close to us there were elephants we we, we could not uh, notice it and and some of the elephants are notorious in thattegard that many boarders have got a very bad experience from elephants in thattegard uh, and we really excited about this kind of encounters during the survey uh, and and we again we go back to dr salim ali like how he narrate his experience in the wild and many places we also got the same kind of experiences about the uh, elephants or whatever uh, in that particular habitat so then from there we went to kotayam uh, kotayam is uh, basically lowland kotayam is mostly a rice belt with a wet, large number of wetland birds and uh, from Kot from kotayam we surveyed a lot of locations kumaragam paddy fields kaipuramutt Vatangari, uh, a lot of Alapuri, Memnad Lake, Padramanal, 24,000 paddy fields, and a lot of uh, places we were regularly making. But uh, you can see the changes are uh, mostly uh, into uh, the wetlands have actually converted into uh, you know uh, agriculture lands uh, and raised uh, beds of uh, that is suitable for coconut plantation. So especially in Kutnad areas and all that. So we salimily recorded about 81 species there and we recorded 121 and uh, some important species are white neck stock, uh, oriental honey buzzard. So first record for the area at that time. And we could see the uh, 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 a different group of acula eagles like uh, Indian spotted, greater spotted and steppy. Uh, and these are some uh, new additions uh, 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 to that area. And also the gray headed lapwing. So these are some of the uh, interesting species that we found uh, in that area, not found by Salim Ali at that time. And I think the Aquila eagles wintering in southern Kerala was not uh, that much recorded in earlier uh, record bird records and all that. It's a, some kind of a new addition in recent times. I'm talking about uh, 10 years before, no? you have to remind that talking about some 2009 period of time. And, uh, and Salim Ali uh, wrote about the Padiramanal uh, uh, lake. Lake around Padiramanal mentioned by Salim Ali as a place of congregation of thousands of birds. Uh, uh, he mentioned about different species of birds. Now we could see only a little bit of cormorants. So that is what left. And uh, and we saw more house, house boats than birds in, in Padiramanal and the Vabanad Lake. So ducks and teal now have concentrated mostly on the inland uh, you know, paddy fields and all that. So, where we went to the Padiramanal uh, uh, um, uh, Lake and all that, so we could not see much bird. Then we had to find out, we have to travel much more inside to see where are the birds gone. Then we found that many of the birds are moving much more, much more interior uh, wetland areas for foraging and all that. And the, the entire water body is now occupied by the uh, the new birds. Uh, uh, like uh, the houseboats and all that. So Salimali clearly mentioned the, the Vampanad Lake has crystal clear water through which the sandy bottom 10 feet or more below was clearly visible. So when we travel in the same area, we could see the, uh, the, the basically the oil on top of the lake and we could not see any anything into the sea, uh, any, anything into the water, like, you know, uh, even ten, not even 10 feet, quite even one feet, we cannot see because a lot of houseboats are running through the Vabanat Lake and they are discharge all the kind of uh, waste into the uh, lake and we, uh, the lake is actually uh, contaminated with uh, pollutants and all that and very few birds actually visit this area. So the change is uh, much more visible in terms of our wetlands. So we could see more houseboats than birds in that place. And when we walked along the uh, uh, in some interior places, we could see some isolated nesting of baya, uh, a very specific bird. Uh, you know, if you if you talk about Salim Ali and his uh, early early works and all that, so we are happy to see some birds of baya we were actually nesting on the uh, coconut garden, and some aquila eagles have actually occupied these areas. And at that place, we met uh, Dr. P. V. George. Uh, yeah, maybe I don't know many of them, many of us remember Dr. George. Dr. George actually worked with Salim Ali for some time and he's the person who identified the, uh, the wagtails who are roosting in, in, in Kotayam for the first time. And he associated and Salim Ali actually in, in, in later in 1960s, he visited uh, Kotayam for large scale ringing of birds uh, right. along with uh, Dr. P.V. George. And Dr. George then later moved into uh, Iraq for working uh, some other projects. And uh, we met him on the way and he shared his memories about Dr. Salim Ali. And, uh, and, and he says about the kind of work he was, especially ringing and uh, tagging 
uh, wagtails. So he actually found that uh, uh, when he was working in that uh, in, in his place, he found uh, wagtails are moving in certain direction. So he followed the groups day by day, day by day, and found out the finally the roosting place. And then he wrote to uh, BNHS and Sarimali himself was came and they they ringed a lot of birds and that actually uh, uh, gave a lot of uh, information about the uh, the migratory uh, parts of these uh, these birds. So. Then from there we went to Pyramid. Pyramid uh, uh, is a, a small hill area, and uh, there Salimali actually recorded about seventy-seven species, and we got about one hundred thirty-seven species. And if you look at Pyramid habitat, uh, so I think uh, one of the place that has actually badly hit by the development and other activities is one of the Pyramid. So degraded severely, resulting in low bird population. And most of the uh, uh, grasslands have become rocky cliffs. Uh, we observed several days of continuous fire in the grasslands and forest area during the stay and pyramid. And birds are very, very low. So these are the photos we taken during our visit. So the, the hill was burning and nobody was attending. So it's like a one day, second day. So in the initial first day, we thought like somebody will uh, stop it, but uh, we could not see anybody going into the hills and stopping the uh, burning in the grassland. So, so that is the kind of attitude of the local people who are not much concerned. And year after year, these kind of forests are burning and, and remaining as a small, you know, grassy patches and the bird diversity. And this is the same photograph we taken during the night and the fire was continuing. And we saw some uh, uh, Shaheen falcon nesting at uh, Grampi. And you can see the, 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 the grass. Uh, so the Shaheen actually nest on a cliff uh, and uh, the, the grasses around the cliff actually all burn. And this pair was survive, struggling to survive in that burn area. And we wait there for some time. But uh, you know that I think that when I talked to the local people, they said that uh, every year people put fire. But Shahin Vakar, you know that we have very few pairs in the entire uh, stretch of the Western Ghats. If you look at only a only, only couple of pairs uh, breeding in, 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 in the Western Ghats side. So these birds are actually at risk. So this kind of birds like Shaheen actually nest in a very uh, unique cliffs. So such cliffs are very much limited if you walk along the mountain ridges of Western Ghats, you'll find out. So habitat. And when we went to another uh, forest area, and people say there's a, uh, uh, when Salimali mentioned a certain area, we walked along that. From there, we, we reached the mountain top, and we could not see any uh, any trees in that mountain, but we could see a JCB and other symbols of, uh, you know, uh, activities in that area. So this was actually taken from that week. So we we walked about uh, almost, uh, almost one and a half hours in that hill. We could not find even a single bird. And this was actually a tomb uh, by the Pir Muhammad who stayed in that uh, uh, pyramid at that time. And uh, the, the, the monument was constructed by the Travancore Raja. And the Travancore uh, uh, Raja was actually used uh, 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 to visit this pyramid as a hill station. And there was a palace built by the uh, uh, Raja. And that time uh, he constructed this, but now this is completely abandoned and nobody is attending this and it is in a very ruin and people used to write a lot of names on that and making their own uh, monument. So uh, during my trip, uh, Salimali wrote uh, about uh, during my camp at this place between 20 and 26 February, I only saw a single example, uh, which also appeared as if it had urgent business elsewhere. He's talking about crows. So during my camp at this place between 20 and 26 February, I only saw a single example, which also appeared as if it had urgent business elsewhere. And we actually, uh, uh, we used the same way to depict the changes during our stays. And five years later, we could see only crows everywhere uh, without much business. So there are a lot of crows in that area. So I think the habitat has changed in attracting more of generalists into the hills where we have made a lot of uh, disturbances on the ecosystem. So we, these are, so this is the general kind of photography. Topography. You can see the burned hillsides and the remaining bush of a small undergrowth. And that again, go under uh, you know, tremendous fire year after year. And how the existing habitats, which are available in many parts of the Southern Kerala is getting degraded over a period of time. From there, we went to Kumli. Uh, this is the river uh, Periyar. So we had a long trek along with the uh, uh, PTR tiger, currently the PTR tiger reserve. And there's a morning uh, light in the Periyar, uh, unseen Periyar. That would say Periyar is much more polluted when it reaches to Ernakulam. But on the mountain tops, Periyar is very pristine. 
and there are a lot of fishes in the uh, river and we stayed somewhere close to that and the forest team was very much waiting for us. We reached uh, after two days of uh, trekking and uh, traveling through boat and uh, there was we got some very good facility at that uh, very much interior places and from where the uh, uh, took travel into much more deeper places in, in, in the Periyar, much more wider landscape. So Kumli, uh, Salimali actually recorded 105, we recorded 186, and we found fish eagle, lesser kestrel, red-winged kestrel kuku, Malayan high night for and all that. And uh, uh, sighting of a lesser fish eagle was very important, and it is well protected as a tiger reserve, sending species of raptors, seven woodpeckers, the lake, is, uh, when Salimeli wrote in 1933, the lake itself is an absolute washout as far as birds are concerned. And now there are a lot of several uh, water birds have colonized in the lake. And there's an impact of um, changes that is over a period of time. <clears throat> and from there, within the Peria Tiger Reserve, we went to a place called Mangala Devi. And there is a temple on that. And there is also a, a watchtower in Mangala Devi. And that temple is now allowed uh, once in a while, uh, local people are allowed to worship from Tamil Nadu. This is actually in the ridge of the Western Ghats, so people can, Tamil Nadu can come up. And this is another place called Uppubara. It's a, it's a grassland about uh, about 1000 meters. And uh, once we climbed up the mountain, you can see the, the Shabrimala just uh, down there. And you can see how Shabrimala is located within the whole of uh, uh, forest area. And it's a growing uh, township within the entire. Uh, so in the initial uh, visit, we thought there is some mist coming in. That's why we, we climbed up the hill and then looked back, this not the mist, but the, 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 the smog that's coming out, burning the waste that is produced from the small township. So, and then the same mountain, we could see the lesser crystal, one of the rare sightings uh, from the uh, grasslands. And again, the common buzzard we observed in Kaki. And in, in the uh, uh, same uh, uh, Periyar uh, uh, Tigris or those called uh, Iriki area, uh, we went to a place called Camp Daramalai. So this is the downtown estate. This is the place Alimali actually stayed uh, during his Ravan Guru coaching uh, uh, ornithological survey. And uh, these are the photograph of uh, J.R. Vincent and his sister and the owners of the estate uh, uh, when Salimali visited that place. So this uh, photographs and the furniture, I think the same furniture, everything is kept intact in that room. This is owned by some private uh, uh, family there. And they are very hospitable and they were uh, actually their property as well managed and we could see the nesting of a Malabar pied hornbill uh, within that. So this is a small enclosure uh, within the whole Pedia Tiger Reserve and well-preserved area. So Salimali stayed in this place and traveled uh, within that uh, uh, periphery and all. So Dharamale, uh, Salimali recorded 52 and we recorded 96. And we saw the Rufus Bell Eagle, Shaheen Falcon, Great Pied Hornbill Nesting, Great Red Bull Bull, Why Not Laughing Thresh, Franklin Nightjar. And uh, interesting findings were the great pied hornbill nesting. And uh, grassland birds are affected by the frequent fire because the Sabrimala, uh, above Sabrimala, the grasslands are burned most of the time. And that actually affected the grassland birds. So for example, so this is the, uh, you can see the right side of the mountain hills are actually burned. So I think uh, there was a purposeful burning of the grassland for uh, making space for the pilgrims. So during the Magravaluka, a lot of people come on the top of the mountain and they watch the uh, uh, the uh, that uh, that particular lighting, and uh, so this being cleared. And in later period of time, there was some stampage and a lot of people died uh, in this because a huge number of visitors come into that area. So this is the nesting. Uh, sorry, this is the nesting of the uh, great pied hornbill. So this kind of huge trees are required. So Salimari was talking about. Uh, this kind of uh, great pied hornbills in some other area where the trees are all cut off and there was not much bird left. And we, we could see the, the, the wild boar that's coming out from Shabrimala to some other nearby areas. And suddenly we wonder that we found a wild boar close to us and it's not uh, running at all. So normally this kind of animals comes as to closer to us, it will, will not remain with us. And this is very friendly. Then we, and when we looked at that where he comes from. So it's just coming from the uh, downhill, uh, that Shabrimala region. And they are very much used to the uh, people and, and like that. And this is another location Salimali said is called Rajambara. So uh, one of the old uh, uh, travelers uh, uh, place. So Salimali stayed in this place. And our uh, so here we found Black Baza, Large Valley, Beef Labler, Rakeyard, Nijar. And uh, 
yeah as i said uh, the sabrimala pilgrimage is creating heavy damage to the forest especially garbage plastics glass bottles human everything is there and one of our team member has got an injury from the broken glass uh, while we were trekking to the uh, forest side even both sides of the highway was actually uh, filled with the thrown out plastics and all that i don't know what is the situation now and we found certain birds nesting in that area especially great tit and black basa and crested goshawk and we then from there we went to tenmala and uh, you can see this old man this is dr dn matthew uh, who has done phd under dr salim ali and we should say dr matthew as even though he is uh, 60 plus at that time he actually joined us for a um, uh, few days along with us climbing all the difficult mountain terrains and all that and was a great inspiration for us to uh, do the survey so he was sharing a lot of experience working with salim ali at that time and he enjoyed a lot of his company and many often we have to wait for uh, dean matthew to come and join in our uh, phase of walking and uh, white bellied sea eagle we found and we found a nest of lesser fish eagle the first time in south india the first nesting of uh, location of the lesser fish eagle was found during the survey and that was happened in in, in that uh, tenmala reservoir while we were traveling to the 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 far the end of the reservoir and uh, and small patting gold grey breasted excellent diversity of birds this is the white bellied sea eagle we found in tenmala and the lesser fish eagle and this was the nest of the uh, lesser fish eagle so we were actually resting on a uh, forest camp and we everywhere were lying down on their uh, some uh, rocks and all right so suddenly we looking at one lesser fish eagle flying into an opposite direction so and landed on a uh, some big tree so immediately we to, uh, took the forest uh, watcher to start the boat and we chased and went into the mount uh, that uh, nearby uh, uh, island and we looked we could not see the bird because after a close watching we could see a small bird inside the uh, canopy and there was a small one which is coming out uh, the, the the baby uh, uh, was there so uh, this was the first record of the lesser fish eagle in the region and 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 uh, you know jungle owlet and many places from there we went to kanyakumari so you know that travancore state that was that include kanyakumari also and uh, kanyakumari we found around 120 species and salimali about 60 and our interesting species are pelican open bill stock pender stock egrets pheasant hill jacana greater flamingo yeah western reef egret and white crested cuckoo we found on the way uh, through when we are driving through a village and greater flamingos in some small numbers and also spot bell pelicans spot bell duck and bush lark on the road and some spotted owlet on a wooden small tree and black ibis and when you look at the major changes are the arboli wind so the wind farms so how wind farms affect birds we all know that the intensity of wind farms are very high and larger birds like ibises or the pager stocks or whoever is and we saw the birds are struggling to pass through this location like uh, you know whenever the fans you know the leaves comes in in rotation so birds cannot uh, you know uh, fly free uh, through this uh, wind farm so a landing is very much difficult so we were observing from far off places like how birds are trying to pass through the location because many times they have to land on the pools and wetlands that are actually located within this uh, complex of wind farm so that is one one thing we observed at that time like uh, you know uh keeping all the intensity you know in very high intensity if you are planting all these uh, wind farms in in a location where birds are using especially the large birds it's quite difficult for them to uh, pass through this kind of uh, uh, wind farms then from there we went to the the southern corner like uh, avisya um, uh, uh, towards the arboli and uh, where we found around 73 species uh, salimali found 73 and we found 155 our uh, attractions were hupu bayback shrike franklin prinia white broad bulbul and this is the southernmost uh, the highest peak in the southernmost area western ghats is called mahendragiri there you can see the again the garulax uh, uh, you know babblers so that that, uh, that uh, now we described as montesingla and the montesingla chilapens this is one of the uh, four species that we described from the whole of western ghats so you can see this uh, babblers on the top of the mountain and compared to the other mountains like munnar and this actually the grasses are slightly different and the the, the vegetation diversity is also uh, slightly different so there you could see on the on the valley you can see more of the dryland species 
And when you go into the mountains, you can see uh, endemic uh, species such as short wings and laughing rishes or, or dragon orange fly catchers and all that. So in the, in the valley is actually a different kind of vegetation, normally occupied by the white broad bulbuls. Yes, and jungle prenia. So just giving up a, a pulse of uh, the, the landscape where we went into and the kind of birds that we have seen. So gray fangolin, all these are the birds of the plains. So they are not in good numbers. So we came out with the density estimates I will share you and the uh, jungle babblers and ashikron, sparrowlark and ibises. So you that uh, we went to some villages where they they are very nicely keeping the heronry just uh, close to their house itself. And they use uh, the, 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 the bird droppings as a fertilizer into the agriculture farm. So they very, 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 very friendly way of uh, living in the villages. And there we could see ibises, different species of ibises actually foraging on the rice field itself. And, and then this, this is the Baramur estate, another place Salimali lived in. The hills, Salimali, right about this, the hills all over this locality bear traces of abundant tea and coffee estates. So British time, they explored these mountains for uh, coffee estates. And uh, even in the Trivandrum border card and all that, you can see when you go up into the uh, 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 sanctuary, uh, you are up in the mountains, Abyssinia Malay side, you can see the abundant coffee and tea estates in that area. And from there, we went to that um, uh, uh, Muthukuri. Muthukuri is just above the Balamur. And this is in Tamil Nadu. So it was a misty day and that morning. And uh, and the Travancore Maharaja actually built a, a small palace here to spend his summer. But later on, the forest department took it out. Unfortunately, that particular um, uh, palace was actually uh, taken by some private agency. Where, uh, you know, uh, they demolished it and collected all the uh, valuable timber attached to that. Only some watchtowers left that area. And one interesting thing about this place is like uh, Salimali mentioned in his book, uh, at the elevation of the Travelis Bangla, 2000 feet, situated at the edge of the tea estate, mango and jack trees appears to thrive. So we went to the same place and those two mangoes and, and jackfruit are still there. So this is just like one place we really felt of Salimali himself, like, you know, the, he described as such and, uh, and still uh, uh, these trees are still there. So, so I just really wanted to place this picture to show like uh, how he has written about his notes very well and we could trace back to exactly over to the same location and to find out the same trees around the same place and this uh, bangla this travelers bangla is now abandoned not much once in a while for the department are used for some uh, visit and all that so and there from there we where i got a, one of the uh, uh, beautiful picture of this star and sudden uh, on the way back we were trekking back and when we when we looked back i was calling my friend just to come back and looked around through the camera, I saw this uh, frame, and I keep this one of the most uh, uh, my most favorite frame from the whole survey of the Salimali Trail. And this is the Muthukuri while, and and we had a, a lot of problems in between. Sometimes uh, we faced elephants, and sometimes uh, jeep broke down, and we have to help ourselves and a lot of times. And and it was not a smooth journey at all uh, because of the terrain. And you know that uh, some of the terrains are, uh, even though we were uh, supported by jeeps and all that, certain mountains are very difficult to climb, even with the four wheel jeep, because the edges are very, uh, very cliff like and uh, traveling, especially traveling into the Balamur area was very, very difficult. And uh, yeah. And in certain times, uh, this was from the, uh, that, um, uh, that Tara Gandhi talked about the uh, tramway. So we retraced uh, tramway to some extent up to a up to a, a river, and along the tramway we found uh, there was a watchtower constructed in the forest department, and this elephant was standing very close to that. There is no other way to deviate. We close much closer to the elephant, uh, but our watcher said we can walk along it. So we were all waiting for two three minutes, and our brilliant watches they moved much more closer to the elephant and talked something, and uh, the elephant remained very calm, and we just passed uh, just in front of this elephant and I think it was just like 10-15 uh, feet and the elephant was very calm and we are really excited and after this and we found along the trail and much before the Salima uh, along the trail there was another group of elephants who are already taking trail in Salimali's trail you know this is much abundant now and uh, there was some uh, old remnants of this uh, tramway in some places but the remaining is under the Parmiculum uh, uh, Tiger Reserve and up to the Chalakudi side. So, uh, but the, there is a, there is a trek path where you can trek 
but you will end up in 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 one river where you cannot cross that area there was earlier there was a bridge or you have to drive through the uh, river when in summer you can cross and come back to the chalakudi uh, from barbikulam so in balamur estate uh, we 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 found around uh, 87 species and salimali found around 60 species so white bellied blue fly catch uh, black bull bull and the eurasian blackbird philippine shrike and and these are one of the highlights the gray breasted laughing the, the southern most uh, Ashambuans is that meridional olafic uh, 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 at that time. So, yeah, the broad tailed grass poplar, which was, uh, and these pictures are from the uh, the Upuvara grassland where uh, it is being frequently burned, and we could see a very few broad tailed grass poplar altogether. So, we, we have a list of birds, we have endemic birds we signed, and after that, uh, we went to Trivandrum. So, when we moved to Trivandrum, uh, these are the pictures that we uh, took from Trivandrum. Uh, Trivandrum has become much more an urbanized center, and you can see across everywhere. And uh, Salimele actually recorded uh, about uh, 72 species of forest birds in the current uh, city environments. And now in 20, uh, 29, 2009, we could see only 27 forest species. So that's a much more the generalist group. So you can imagine what has changed over a period of time in, in, in Trivandrum. And, uh, and, the, and, the, and the town and uh, urban, you know, the urbanization has actually moved much more into the mountain areas and all that, and we are losing. So how, how much uh, the urbanization can impact uh, birds, especially uh, there was um, uh, one of the records from the museum states that they actually collected changeable hockey eagle from the city of in 1900 or something like that. And Salimali actually recorded uh, 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 a lot of birds. So you can see the white broad fandel flycatcher in the Tuvatum city, copper smith poplar, yellow front pied woodpecker, rufous woodpecker, ashy crown, eastern skylark, large cuckoo shrike, small minimum, common wood shrike, black crested bulbul, jadens chloropsis, Indian rufous wabbler, yellow throated sparrow, blithe starling, broad strongo. All these are from the uh, current city, golf course, and city environments only. So there are no much bears left now. And uh, uh crows are the most uh, uh, common species in that place then from there we went to panmudi so in this picture you can see e kunikrishnan who actually joined into andram along the survey team and black shouldered kite one of the common and the panmudi we saw the brown rock pipit uh, the long bill pipit that what we say now that's uh, in common in in this uh, mountain tops and a lot of uh, changes in panmudi also because of the tourism infrastructure and other uh, governmental infrastructures and this is the remaining uh, part of the travancore uh, uh, that, that uh, uh, our uh, uh, tramway that particular tramway i just added this picture later slowly slightly misplaced but just wanted to show selling uh, uh Kumar. and this is uh, up to certain point you can still walk along the uh, tramway and uh, overall, uh, looking at total number of species, we found about 320. Salimali recorded about 276. And we have made a comparison. These are available in the books. And, and significant absence are house crow in Mariur, uh, uh, Munar house crow, jungle crow, Indian tree pie, house, uh, house sparrow, red banded bulbul, Shantanbara jungle, jungle babbler, red banded bulbul, Tatekar. So, all il, each location says we have made an presence and absence, what has changed in our period of time and we made uh, a lot of absence like house and that time house crow house sparrow indian tree pie great teeth black floor teeth and uh, many many other places so uh, uh so uh salimali again dot i just wanted to remind you about this uh about the the, the density of crows that is coming up and about vultures in the beginning i talked about you so one of the significant absence in the town coaching survey finding is that about the uh, loss of vultures. So uh, Salimiri wrote in 1933, uh, red-headed vulture about perhaps the most common vulture in Travancore and Cochin and generally distributed throughout the area. So that is very significant. Like uh, red-headed vulture is now not at all seen in the entire Kerala. Whatever remaining is about eight to nine, 10 to 10 or 15 individuals in the Vainad Wildlife Sanctuary that is in contiguous with the uh, Mudumalai Bandipur Tiger Reserve. And at Mariur, uh, he talked about red headed vulture, only vulture, and often seen as two or three in every cattle carcass. 
on one occasion at pirimad over 20 of these redheaded uh, these birds had collected and carcass to the almost exclusion of other species at padagiri also an assemblage of about 30 were observed on some scrappy remains of a nilgiri thar so that means that even in the mountain tops even a nilgiri thar remaining uh, vultures used to come so in about long bill vultures you must be very interesting seven or eight birds appeared suddenly at a carcass of a dog when a single one was not in evidence in this locality during the last 10 days over 15 birds of this species at remains of a nilgiri thar in a steep valley not uncommon generally distributed in small numbers in travancore and had Uh, and its status in Cochin is absolutely the same. So Whistler and Ali 35, 37. Then comes the Indian white-backed vulture. This is perhaps the commonest vulture in Travancore and Cochin, though by no means as abundant as it is, for instance, in the Deccan and in many other parts of Peninsula. Salim Ali Cord Skinlock, who stated that at Nilayamba, this white-backed vulture comes up as a temporary visitor from the plains and only roosts up there if watched. So you can clearly see the vulture has gone extinct. from the south forever so egyptian vulture also so not uncommon in the dry low country of south travancore and in similar places also in cochin through never abundant frequenting the neighborhood of towns and villages so nanmara vadakanjeri arambori and kel so all these four species of vultures have disappeared from the south forever so this is one of the uh, significant finding even south of palghat we could not see any of this and you know that the diclofenac issue came much later and uh, when we enquired further about this in a in a in a, in a mudwan community local indigenous uh, community and one of the uh, member one older man told told us that this vultures were uh, lost because of the poisoning by the cattle herders in the polachi and chinnar side uh, when the leopard and tiger when leopard used to attack the cattle uh, and they used to poison the carcass of the uh, 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 cattle which is dead and to kill the leopard but what happened the vultures used to come and feed on the carcass and they lost uh, by occasion by occasion and by i think by almost by 70s or 80s the whole vultures of the south india as uh, the southern side of uh, kerala has gone not even in tamil nadu kolachi and that side so in general uh, we would like to conclude with this like uh, you know the habitat general is like a uh, crow tree pie house sparrows were earlier mostly uh, spread in that uh, uh, you know woodlands and, uh, and and hills of the coastal area up to the hills but in in by, during the last uh, 775 years of time and they have expanded into the mountain tops like uh, the habitat especially like the crows tree pies and house parrots bulbuls and all that they have gone much more onto the uh, mountain tops uh, as we have actually uh, moved much more into the hilly pristine uh, mountain region along with uh, the, the the development and other infrastructure development roads and buildings and everything and these generalist birds are also moving on to the mountain so what is happening in the mountain top is that when the generalists are coming on to the mountain top it is going into an area where the specialists are there for example there will be competition for between species like uh, a bulbul so if the, the red whisker and red winter reach, reaches into a mountain top which is normally occupied by a black bulbul so there will be competition for resources and that will in turn we will decide who will win in a in a situation where uh, especially versus for generalist scenario so a lot of other birds will also be impacted especially during the with the presence of uh, crows in the location so crows are very good in taking out uh, eggs and nest of eggs of for many of the smaller birds so we could see we have to study how, how these dynamics are working on the mountain tops when generalists are moving more and more into the mountains so uh, uh, we also calculated as we as i shared in the beginning we calculated density estimates because of the methodology we adopted and we calculated density of the 49 species uh, which have occurred more than 60 districts during the survey and about them even special seven species of migrants and five species of endemics have been estimated hillmina came as the most uh, uh, common and uh, most dense year birds in the south Jengilko was absent in five out of nineteen locations in thirty-three. Now established at a rate of fourteen birds per square kilometer in all locations. So you can imagine the kind of uh, uh, changes that has happened. And migrant species, if you look at even the South Kerala forest, uh, uh, you know the greenish leaf warbler is one of the uh, 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 most dense uh, birds in our forest ecosystem. And even the recent studies during the uh, uh, recent observation from the eBird also shows that. that this uh, you know green leaf warblers all come to the south for wintering and our forests in the southern side of western ghats and kerala are very very important 
a habitat for these migratory birds to survive during the winter and they are one of the very high dense birds very, very seen in good very good density in the southern mountains and black seed warbler by followed by greenish and large bill leaf warbler and then ashy drongo eurasian golden oriole asian paradise flycatcher and great so we have given a, a set of uh, density estimates for certain species which we are able to uh, estimate density uh, within the detections and all so endemics one of the good density is blue wing parakeet small sunbird gray hornbill gray bustle of in this white belly tree pie among the bulbuls red whiskered yellow browed black wood bull red bended etc and the whole findings have been uh, found uh, as published as a book by the state forest department along the trail of salimali and after this work we were asked by the state forest department to do uh, the remaining part of the kerala so for example the travancore cochin was covered covered by the salimali at that time we revisited and the government at that time forest department actually uh, take a decision that now we have covered half of the state and why can't you co cover the rest of the state and later on uh, we were we took undertook that assignment also and covering the entire uh, north of palagat and covering the all six uh, districts of the uh, northern kerala spending another one and a half almost one and a half years in the forest of uh, northern kerala covering the whole state of kerala almost uh, two to two and a half three years of time so these two findings have come up as two books uh, which uh, we try to uh, give maximum uh, you know justice to the work done by dr salim ali even though it was difficult in many times to compare uh, the results of both but uh, yeah i should uh, acknowledge uh, clearly the forest department kerala forest department for taking up this uh, challenge challenging work and the then uh, uh, principal chief conservator k manoharan and the tamil nadu chief forest conservator sundar raju the then ccf trivedi babu kaler shooting yalaki all, all people have all retired and uh, uh, james akaria and c abdul bashir r radhakrishnan who was the wildlife assistant uh, stand into andam he accompanied us in many trips dr d n matthew dr v s vijayan grub e kunjikshan dr namir pravin j dr suhel kadar shankar raman and suhel shankar pravin are all helped in developing the methodology fine tuning and coming for the review in between in in, in parbikulam and uh, later on they are also helped us in uh, uh, you know reading the draft of the report and and to tara gandhi who helped to collect the salimali papers from negro museum i am i am much happy that uh, tara gandhi is also present here to listen this uh, findings so thank you so much this is the end of my talk thank you vishnu that was very fascinating we have now opened the chat chat box to anybody who wants to ask any questions Okay. Yeah. So we have the first question coming in, Vishnu. Which uh, the questions from Shuvendu, who's asking that several bird species were absent during your uh, during Salimani survey, but present during your survey, like the common buzzard. What is the difference between your survey dates or season compared to Salimani's, and what could be the reason behind a migratory bird suddenly becoming uh, so so common? yeah regarding the dates uh, we followed the same dates at same location there is no change so salimali spend uh, uh, second uh, january to 8th in uh, morayur we were on the same dates on the same location that's how the retracing was done there was no change so that is one thing and regarding the uh, uh, presence of this common um, bazaar like species in 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 a south uh, mountains i don't know much about it why they are coming suddenly it's so maybe there is a changes in the uh, uh, climatic conditions or they find it more uh, 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 more favorable conditions over a period of time especially uh, you know the, the, the changes in temperature or i don't know exactly what caused this bird to extend their range so it it happens when suitable habitats are available for certain species to move for example Uh, uh you know i found in certain mountain tops in in western ghats also in certain areas uh, certain birds are able to come when the when the temperature favors or the or the quality of the forest changes from a very good uh, thick evergreen forest into semi deciduous kind of a forest with a certain kind of plants which are more uh, you know growing upward then the species attached to those kind of niches can also come up to the mountain but on the long migrants uh, i don't know much about it thank you good uh, 
we don't have any other questions as of now um maybe in the meantime like if we have some more questions coming in we can just share details of next week's talk uh just give me one second yep so next week we've got a talk on the special birds of himachal pradesh by dr abhinav so that's on the 11th of july uh it's again at 5 pm using the same zoom meeting link as today I don't Great. think we have Thank any other so yeah. questions. Yeah. We can close then, Nick. Yes. Thanks. Thanks, Abhi. Thanks, Vishnu, for being here. And thanks, Sara. See you all next Sunday. Sara, you want to have anything to say, Sara? You're muted. I'm very happy to be part of this. Great. Thank you. See you all next Thank Sunday. Thank you. Bye. Yes.